All right, welcome back, everyone. This is a new year. We're now in 2023. Brad Spotlight Podcast here. I'm Alexis Soto, joined by Peter for the second time in a number of weeks now. So, of course, it's a special occasion that he's even here and, you know, not wasting away and able to record on a podcast here. We talk about all the things movies and so much more and what a year it was in movies. I was just reading this list, by the way. I don't. I think it was Entertainment Weekly or was it Variety? I don't remember what was it, but they were counting all the biggest news stories of last year, and it was a pretty depressing year, <laughs> I think wholesale. Um, you may have noticed that in the last couple of months, we haven't really dedicated much time to discussing movie news or box office as, as we used to, because well, it's all the same story. It it it's all just gone to shit, hasn't it? Uh, Post-COVID, it's just a disaster where no one feels the impetus to go see a film out in the theater unless it's one of the three, if at, they see a year, if that. And it's gotten so much worse now, and every film is now perpetually bombing, some of which we'll actually discuss today. Um, but it's been rather depressing, and so that's why we've put much more of a focus on the films that we've seen, and we've seen so many more, and we just want to promote those movies and talk about the things that we like instead of, um, you know, you know, last year, what was it? It was Warner Discovery, you know, David Zaslav came in, and his reign of terror has only gotten started. He just recently canceled, like, half of the seasons of the Looney Tunes on HBO Max, just pulled them off, because reasons probably gonna sell him yeah <laughs> yeah yeah he's just stripping warner brothers for parts and what's even worse there's speculation that he's getting it ready to sell it to universal which is even more of a disaster and i don't even want to think about that because it's so it just it disgusts me outright um it was the year that Batgirl was canceled that was one of zaslav's first uh decisions and of course we that was the disaster in and of itself uh, James Gunn and David Zafran uh, are now head of DC, and they fired Henry Cavill, so and a bunch of other uh, familiar faces. So a lot of you know big movement. Um, Bob Chapek picked a fight with Ron DeSantis and lost, and then he was fired, and Bob Iger is back. Um. Oh, and did we mention that every film under the sun, not named Mar, not under the name of Marvel Studios or James Cameron, um, bombed. Horribly. That may have been mentioned already, but you know, just to put it out there. I always count on you for the fun stories. <laughs> and uh, you know, so many fun stories. Uh, also, the incident that happened at the Academy Awards. Everybody was having a, such a good night, and then, you know, Will Smith slapped somebody, and it was like dramatic for a minute. And then it seemingly has gone way over proportion at this point, but. It was a moment that everybody saw on live TV. Although I will, I'm thankful that it, it does make the case for live TV. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of, you know, this is a movie podcast. I think we can safely say that the Academy Awards last year was just another epic disaster as it usually is every year. I mean, the slap notwithstanding, um, they cut out eight categories and it went to four and a half hours long. That's, <laughs> that's a, I don't know <laughs> what's going on. It's like cursed. Every year. Every year it's something. It literally is. Every year is a disaster. So I can't wait to see how they're going to mess it up this year. They, they couldn't even get a performance of We Don't Talk About Bruno right last year. That's how bad it was. Every year. That was really bad. How hard is it to just <laughs> do the, the fucking song? Not your, <laughs> not your oh, your cheeky take on it. Fuck that. After they didn't even nominate the song. Yeah. It, it was just there because they wanted ratings. And hey, they got ratings, but... Um, nobody seemed to like the ceremony, so let's see how it is this year along with the nominees. Uh, so yeah, uh, it, it's, what can you say? Netflix didn't have a great year either. Um, we live in a capitalistic society and it demands growth for the sake of growth. And because of that, Netflix and all of what it's been doing has been proclaimed a failure. And so it's been, you know, trying to do a whole bunch of new things, like a new ad tier, uh, subscription service, you know? to get some numbers up here and going. They've been canceling a lot of shit. Animation's not in a great place because, you know, between Netflix and HBO Max, um, it's just being the first one to, you know, let go. It's a lot of depressing shit here. <laughs> I'm sorry to, to drudge all of this up, but that was the year. So, um, hey, there was that. 
Anyway, as far as for today is this year, we're going to obviously this year going to be talking about so many more movies. And, you know, we're ramping up toward the Oscars, which, if I'm not mistaken, are going to be, I believe, the week of the 15th of March. So we're pretty close-ish. Um, and later on this month, I want to say on the 27th of January, we're going to have the uh, nominations to the Academy Awards. And in these next two weeks, we'll have the Critics' Choice and the Golden Globes. Uh, go first and see who they award. And of course, we're going to be here for all of that coverage and more. But for today, what are we doing today? Well, we have some big movies to discuss. Peter finally saw Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery, or as he prefers to call it, Glass Onion, A Benoit Blanc Mystery, although I think that's a far superior title. And of course, reasons uh, and the powers that be did not allow that to be the actual title of it because we need like, you know, IP um identification we also mm-hmm. have to review the whale the latest film by uh darren aronofsky and brendan fraser and then babylon which is the latest from damien chazelle and goodness how could you have like gone the holiday week uh break and not gone you know and not seen <laughs> babylon or at least heard about the discourse the endless discourse of the movie so that's that's today's show here on 428 that's a lot of episodes um before we get to any of this uh i just had to blow through a couple of movies that i've seen have you been seeing anything besides these movies that i mentioned Mm, no no because i've seen so many i've seen too many and i'll just go i think (laughs) you need to like drink water or something why i don't think yours has have time to currently well okay um, Feels like you're skipping meals just to see these movies. Well, it's it's a mixture of movies. I had a lot of time. Over, I had two weeks off, so I had plenty of time to see any, a lot of things. And it was a mixture of a lot of films that I did not care for, and then some films that I really, really enjoyed to really loved. Um, we should start off with This Place Rules, because that's the one you recommended me to see yesterday. It's a documentary, yes. A24 documentary, streaming right now on HBO Max. And it is... Um, directed by Andrew Callahan. And this has to deal with like the, the way that I would describe this film is a great document documentation of the absolute bat shit insanity that exists in the country that you don't want to spend too much time thinking about, but you have to be confronted with it in all its glory. And, for why it was the perfect conditions for the violence that broke out on January 6, 2021. It's very much, I would think, the single best documentation for um, why that happened and for why the conditions that existed, uh, that exist, allowed that to happen. And um, half of it, look, a good portion of it is quite hilarious. But then you have to rem- you have to remind yourself that these are actual human beings and this is not a movie. Like this is actual these are actual thoughts that people have in this country and it makes you just like I know Sam Cedar said once, I think it was a year ago when he was reacting to a video of some lady singing Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You, but she rewrote the lyrics to an anti-lockdown, anti-masker vax thing at a city council meeting. As you do. <laughs> and his response to that was, it's hard to see that and uh, think that this country has the durability to last much longer into the future. And watching this documentary, yeah, you, you kind of sense like, it's also a great like microcosm or uh, it, it captures a moment that was the middle of the pandemic between March of 2022 I think January 2021, and a lot of ha- things happened. Of course, we all remember being trapped indoors in those many, many long months. But there was a particular moment where he says here that it really did feel to a point that there was about to be a second civil war because of just how much anger was out there and how much was erupting. And I I, I thought it was a captivating watch. I thought it was one of the funniest things I've seen all year, and then also one of the most depressing things I've seen all year in one. So I would say it's a must watch. Peter? <laughs> um, I have 
recommended Andrew Callahan to you many, many times. As he states in the documentary, he has a YouTube channel called Channel 5, of which I have shared many of his videos on the uh, on the group chat. Julio as well. So um, Your point being? You know what my point is. <laughs> He's brilliant. He's one of the best journalists working out there today. And I think this film is a fantastic encapsulation as to why. He loves to go to some of the most craziest places in America and simply put a mic in people's face and just let them go. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't question them. He doesn't fight with them. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't do anything. He's just... <clears throat> And I think that's why he's able, because you saw he got some amazing interviews. Some of the best interviews that. I've seen, yeah. And and, and these like, people like some high profile, people. yeah, high profile people who are quite known for being very um, adversarial toward mm -hmm. reporters and journalists in general. Yes, um, like he is one of the few people that's still able to. I feel do that kind of journalism and do that kind of stuff. He got interviews um, with like the the I guess the the head Proud Boy. He got interviews with Alex. Jo he got amazing footage of Alex Jones. A lot a lot of content from him. Yeah. Um. For me, this is he's honestly I think it's one of the best films of the year. Yeah. <laughs> it is incredible. It is entertaining. <laughs> from beginning to end, mm -hmm. but it's also just an an amazing encapsulation of this moment in time, and just it's it's very interesting just looking at the dominoes, yeah. right? Even if you know how they fall, um, yeah. I want to play just a couple of sound bites, just to, oh because people, God. I think, uh, documentaries are a bit of a harder sell for people, especially political ones. So I want to, you know, entice people who are listening to go mm. see this and play some clips that I thought were just, oh my God. <laughs> Breathing in the Holy Ghost, where I boast in the Lord and His holy pleasure. I that's I, that's an incredible rap. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this I don't even know what where this came from, but. I I don't even know where that came from. Like he got very angry about the soda. <laughs> oh yeah, he did. Yeah. <laughs> There was there was this one person that was um, saying now he knows what it feels like to be a Jew in the Holocaust, leading up to the because Holocaust. Because he wears a, a MAGA hat. Yeah. yeah. It's um, and there's some twists and turns in there. Uh, yeah, too many. A, if well, here's Alex Jones. It's art. It hilariously reminds me of um, what's his name, Judd Hirsch in the Fablemans, where he was like saying, um, I guess Sammy was questioning sticking your head in the lion is art. No, that was balls. Making sure the lion doesn't eat me. That's art. And is it, I don't know if he does this a lot, but this is the first time I've seen Alex Jones admit he's an actor. Like, he basically just admitted, like, right there, like, oh, yeah, I'm just using these people. How do you how do you look at that and not realize he's just openly admitting that he's just a freaking con artist? Well, basically all of them. Yes. It. Even the Proud Boy guy. Yeah. Enrique Torrio. Who was a um, diversity hire to rebrand their image. <laughs> That's right. No, this 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 is incredible. It really is. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things though that I I thought was quite powerful is in terms of how it ended, because we wrapped back around to a particular Southern family who drank the Kool Aid 
And then after January 6th, they, they're reassessing, they're reevaluating a lot of certain things. And one of the, um, characters, if you want to call it that, is, is a small child who is just now spelling it out really like there was saying that there was, there was no point to them being used. It, it just mm-hmm. is what it is. And it, it kind of makes you like, I don't know think for a moment that maybe these people aren't too far gone. Maybe some of them can be brought back if they see enough. Well, it reminds you that they're people. Yeah. Right? For as much as a cartoon character as they come off of. They, and they do. They very much do. They're people. And there's reasons why they get sucked into this. Right? Like, I think they even... He says, like, the dad says, like, why wasn't... um political before the year 2016 mm-hmm. and then it's um i don't everyone should go see it it's very very interesting yeah they it's also incredible. um i don't know what it is about conservatives but like it's just pretty blatant to me how they, and they don't even see it themselves but like they're, they're just being used to buy merch the merch and the oh money God. being made yeah. off the merch is ridiculous trump made 25 million dollars off selling hats i think that's one of the the largest highlights of um the whole documentary is how the biggest figures in in the like far right um incitement were all just making bank and within the documentary they're all pretty open about it like yeah like i'm about making the money and this makes me money from alex jones to enrique torrio to even that rapper um where he says like i like trump because he's a hustler and he's like and that's (laughs) and he's basically saying like that's what i'm doing I'm hustling. It's um You almost like when you're when you're watching these moments, you have to think for yourself, do they not realize what they're saying? Does it not occur to no. them? I don't think it does. I don't think it does. I, I, and oftentimes people especially these kinds of people don't realize when they give away everything, right? Like they they'll just very casually and calmly drop some huge information on you and you're like whoa like this kind of says a lot about you (laughs) but it doesn't cross their mind no yeah anyway go watch it man go watch it everybody it's amazing and thank you peter for a tremendous recommendation one other thing i want to say here um on some of the other films that i've seen there is a 30 minute short movie called the boy the mole the fox and um the horse and it is one of the films that appeared on the short list um for best animated short film uh, that the Oscar released. Um, and it's uh, streaming on Apple TV+. Plus. Um, and if mm. you can't, there are other ways to see it, as we all know. Anyway, this was such a beautiful movie. Uh, it's a short film. It's very like surface level and straight to the point. But in a way, it also isn't. There's a lot of um, particular lines here that are quite moving and quite powerful um, in a way that I think almost like Del Toro's Pinocchio was. There's some Mm. similarities there, but um, I, 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 this is something that I would think um, even Disney hasn't been able to accomplish with animation thus far. And they've done a lot of films that I think speak to some of the, the themes and the messages here, but overall it's like this boy that's just lost and he finds unlikely companions in the name of a fox, a horse and a mole. And the entire thing is just him. Like not it's, it's an allegory for being lost in life um, and what he can do, you know, as growing up. And I would, I would stress this for anybody that's listening. It's a must watch because aside from all of the, the deeper meaning and everything, the animation is quite beautiful as well. It's hand drawn um and 2d so there's that and of course we can't get enough of that these days um also other short films i've seen animated short films i have saw all of the um this is they're they're technically films because they were like apart they're like 25 to 30 minute short movies 
but the I think they're called the Wonderful World of Mickey Mouse. But there's four of them that mm. came out last year. It was for there were specials for spring, summer, fall, and autumn. No, autumn and winter, and they were outstanding. I had not seen any of the new like Mickey Mouse shorts like ever, and so when I watched these, it was there were wow. I can see I why these are really popular. They're really good. I didn't know they made new shorts. Well, the Wonderful World of Mickey Mouse is like I guess a series of them, and then these were just like part of that, but they were individual. They're they're on Disney Plus. If you go see them, mm. they're really good. They're really really good. And I was like, wow, I would have loved to have had these when I was you know of the age to primarily enjoy them. But they're so good. I would start off with the summer one was hilarious. They were all hilarious. I'll be honest with you, but like they um. And the reason I was kind of turned on to them was because I saw that Mickey Mouse documentary on Disney Plus that had mentioned that they had brought back new Mickey Mouse cartoons. I didn't know about this. Um, I knew it to an extent, but not really. And so this is like my, my first foray into that, and they were well worth the watch. I recommend them all. I saw the Encanto movie at the Hollywood Bowl. Um, the It's a concert movie. It's the music of Encanto. It's the actual cast performing it live. And let's just say... They actually did We Don't Talk About Bruno, right? Whereas the Oscars completely fucked that up. I can't believe how you messed that up. <laughs> I saw Nolan Baumbach's latest film, White Noise, on Netflix with Adam Driver and with Greta Gerwig. Oh, yeah. I saw that was on there, yeah. And it is quite strange. <laughs> um, quite strange in that I'm not entirely sure if it works. I don't think it does. I think a lot of it <laughs> does, and some of it just kind of like... I feel like... It starts off so strong for me, and I'm so interested in all of it, and then it gets to a certain point, I want to say like a quarter, like three quarters into the movie, and then it kept, it keeps going, going, and going, and I just, it lost me to the point where I think it got to the, the closing credits, and I'm like, wow, I, I, I don't care anymore about any of this, which was quite disappointing, because it started off so strong, and then just went, like, we'll see how you feel about it, but it's on Netflix. Mm -hmm. I also saw, and this is quite surprising. One of the best movies of the year, bar none, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. Why is that a surprise? Because no one, I don't think anybody, any of us really thought, like, first of all, now- Us yeah. Puss in Boots heads were <laughs> hyping this film up for months, okay? I remember enjoying Puss in Boots from 2011, all, yeah, all those years ago, but I don't remember the movie at all. It, it, it wasn't memorable to be... I mean, it wasn't bad, but it just wasn't memorable. And on the whole, I don't even remember the last DreamWorks film I even enjoyed. And maybe it was How to Train Dragon 3, but like the last... I don't, like this is not only one of the best DreamWorks animation films ever. Uh, this was really just surprising all the way up and down. You could definitely see the influence of Into the Spider-Verse. We're living in a, in a post Into the Spider-Verse world, and they really were tremendously influenced by that film, not just in terms of its visualistic style, which was, I think, a, an added you know benefit of the film overall, not just in terms of how wonderfully directed the action sequences were, but in, in terms of how the story was constructed um, with themes and arcs that not just work, but are actually quite profound. It's just, it's unbelievably surprising how great this movie is all the way around. And Antonio Ben- You saw it at a movie theater, right? I did, yeah. Okay. No, yeah, because you need to see it in a movie theater to see those- um, I, I Yeah, I, I'd love to see it with in you boots. again uh, <laughs> if, you, if you're down to it, because it was actually mm -hmm. really, really, really good. Uh, Antonio Bandera is, is probably his best performance in this character- in the performance of a lifetime. Yes. Um, he's voiced this character several times, and I think this is the best he's done. Um, and there's actually a villain in this movie that's actually quite terrifying. In comparison, I want to stress, to the lame-ass villains we've had in animated films these last few years. And I will say, like, um, talking about shitty years, animation has suffered greatly mm -hmm. this past year. It's... Like, I don't know what's happening to Cartoon Network. It's kind of fallen apart. They've they've got, they've got destroyed their entire animation division at HBO Max. Yeah. So did Netflix. Mm -hmm. Like, so much shit is just scrapped or being Even the right stuff now. that's going to Disney Plus, there's still, like, this layer of uncertainty around the Marvel animation stuff that was announced. Where is that? That's just so insane to me, because I feel like now more than ever, people love animation. Yes. 
people love mm-hmm. animated show I, like i don't know i don't know yeah it, it was just bad to see it but we had a lot of great stuff at animation up but puss in boots definitely must watch i also saw this small movie that i had heard of in the summer it comes to us by Anthony um, Fabian, who directed films that I'd never heard of before. <laughs> so there was that. But it starred Leslie Manville. Leslie Manville played, I believe, Cyril, who um, was Daniel Day Lewis's sister in the movie Phantom Thread by Paul mm-hmm. Thomas Anderson. And Leslie Manville also is currently playing Princess Margaret on The Crown. Um, this is undoubtedly. One of the, uh, I think one article called this like peak mom cinema. Like we had, oh, no. we had dad cinema for like Top Gun yeah. Maverick, right? This is the opposite of that. This is, but this is so good. Like from the moment this movie begins to the moment the movie ends, it is just endlessly sweet, charming, and it just like embraces you. This character is. It's one of those films where she's just like the definition of a compassionate human being, and she just changes the lives of everybody she encounters because of her decency and kindness. And I don't know how I could not possibly have loved that movie, which I did a lot. Are there any uh, shootouts? No. No, Mm. there are not. But it has a wonderful cast, including (laughs) including French actress Isabel Huppert. Um, Even Lambert Wilson, who is, I think, mainly known for his appearances in the Matrix movies as the, um, what's the character's name again? He plays um, the French guy. Oh, uh, I don't know. Something like the the architect? Not the architect. He plays, um, he's, he's, uh, oh, the Merovingian. Oh, the Merovingian. Yes, he's also in here as well as... um, Jason Isaacs, mm. who's really good in everything he's in. So this is, uh, I'm sure you'd watch this movie and you'd be like, this is good. And you probably wouldn't care much about it, but it's, it's, it's genuinely like one of the most like comfort, like mo- food movies ever made. And mm. if it were up to me, I'd give this movie all the awards. Uh, I'm not crazy about the French. I don't know. Well, it's the English and the French. That's you're not. <laughs> Are you trying to sell it or like destroy? Well, it it's me? up to you. It's currently on our voot. I bought the movie, so it's there. Oh, it it's there. So if you want to see it, it's it, it's um, in a word, this film is delightful. It's hard for any. I, I would think if you walk away from this movie and you hate it, I, I'd question your humanity. Next, um, <laughs> probably the best Michael Bay movie I've ever seen in my life, Ambulance. Um, Ambulance. Ambulance, which is currently streaming on, on Amazon Prime. This stars Jake Gyllenhaal and I believe Yaya oh, abdul Mutum the Tina Second. I have no idea why, but I keep thinking that it's a Netflix film. Uh, yeah, I mean... Patrick Williams released this video recently where he was comparing it to Netflix films of this kind, like The Gray Man. Um... Okay, maybe that... It just seems like a Netflix. Yeah. It seems like a movie Netflix would make at this point in time. I don't know. Well, it was released in theaters, and it didn't do well. Okay, and then yeah. it's now currently streaming on, a- on Amazon Prime. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is invigorating in ways I, I don't think I've ever experienced with a Michael Bay movie. It's it's classic Michael Bay because Michael Bay can be a lot of fun mm-hmm. when he's not dealing with like Transformers. Right? <sighs> what a what a waste of a decade with Transformers like, movies. Yeah, God, he made five of I them, know. right? Yes, five. He could have been making so much other more fun shit. It's like but, Michael um, Bay stopped himself. This is my avatar. Uh, oof, yeah, but he doesn't even give a shit about Transformer. <laughs> this is so funny. But like, I'm, you know, he has like uh, Armageddon, you know, shit like that. I even like um, Pain and Gain. I think that's the last time I was really impressed with Dwayne Johnson. Yes, people say that it was one of his better performances in that movie, Pain and Gain. It is. He's actually really great in Pain and Gain. Um, But that's the last time that I was like, oh, like this is... He's one of those directors that can be great if it fits the film. Mm -hmm. Right? And it sounds like Ambulance is like 
it is it, it fits his, well what's this right movie it's the, these two brothers rob a bank and they also hijack an ambulance and the whole film is just a an extravagant car chase i just remembered that the la and ambulance was like and it's like oh they're in la yep okay yeah i was like you genius you no i would consider this a must watch because it's just so much fun mm-hmm. it is so much fun um next and now we get to some films that I didn't care for. Real quick. Mm, she said, which I shared clips uh, from the movie. I'm not, I'm not watching that movie. <laughs> I'm sorry. You've seen it. I know what it is. Yeah. I don't, I don't <laughs> care. Um, yeah, that's up to you, man. I, but that would be my recommendation as well. I, quite frankly, didn't get it. Like, I don't know what it is. These kind of films usually do it for me mm-hmm. this didn't have it and i don't know if it's maybe it's because the weinstein stuff is too recent it just feels like a waste of time but that feels a bit rude to say because it's like it's really important stuff and people yeah. should like you know know about this so I, I i can't place to you what 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 about it didn't work for me but like this is usually one of my least favorite movies of the year that's what. That's why. Like, it kind of feels fucked up to like say like I don't. I don't even want to watch. But it's like it's a movie. At the end of the day, it's a movie. Yeah. And yeah, I, I just from watching it, it's like I know what this is. Yeah. And I know I'm just not gonna care that much. But I'll I'll finish it, and I'm like, yeah, that was a film. And it's like it's one of those movies where it's like maybe if I was stuck on a plane, and. Of all the choices, it's the only one I haven't seen yet on the little plane TV. Uh huh. And it's like I got a couple hours to kill. I guess I'll watch. Yeah. That's. I think that's the only way I can imagine myself seeing it. But yeah, life's too short. <laughs> Sorry. Lim- similarly to that, um, Sarah Polly's Women Talking uh, is one of the more acclaimed movies of the year and has been a film that has you know been listed on not just several like end of the year lists as some of the best movies of the year, but has also been nominated for awards. This film is about a group of women in an isolated religious colony struggle to reconcile their faith with a string of sexual assaults committed by the colony's men. Um, this one seemed a little bit more interesting to me. It, 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 I'll say this. It was more interesting than she said. N- no doubt. I, I just don't necessarily feel like it is at the end of the day there were interesting conversations and then the decision is made and then the movie ends and i'm like was that really it when it ended i'm like what what?" there's nothing left to chew on with this movie once it's over Mm. it's over and it's like well like you said that was a movie i guess yeah. It, it, it kind of sounds bad, like the two most acclaimed movies, the sexual assault movies, and it's like, we're like, eh, fuck these films. And they have um, the titles, She Said and Women Talking. I know. But in our defense, we championed uh, The Last Night. Oh, no, The Last Duel. The Last Night? <laughs> Sorry, Transformers, I was still on, the last... I still on Transformers. <laughs> I never saw Transformers The sexual 5. assault in that film was um, a choice. Oh, you mean The Last the Duel? La- no, The Last Night. Well, speaking of, the, the, you, know, you know, oh my God, you just pissed me off. You just oh really God. pissed me oh off because oh like, no. not because of what anything you were saying, but like, you're right though. It's like all of a sudden, and, you know, and they're not doing that well, but they're being included in some lists here and there. She said in Women Talking, I'm sorry, but like the premium Me Too movie came out last year called The Last Duel with Jodie Comer, Adam Driver. Matt Damon and Ben Affleck and that was nowhere to be seen that movie was ignored and I haven't seen the other two but I feel like that's the only one that ended with the rapist being brutally mutilated Um, it did it did so yeah there you go we are the real feminist that film is genuinely great (laughs) and I 
I guess the only difference between the uh, the three movies is that the last duel, which is the best one, and I I hope people don't interpret this as me saying that men are better directors than women, but Ridley Scott directed that movie, and he's the only guy, and then the other two mm-hmm. were Sarah Pauly, and I forget the other one, but uh, that I that's exactly what you're putting down, I think. Actually, I don't mean for I'm putting it down because I feel people are gonna go that as they a would line take of that attack. away, yeah. <laughs> well, so, I guess like for she said, it's like okay. I mean, I lived through it. If there's like genuinely interesting stuff behind the scenes that happened, then it's like, okay, well, there's a story. But I know it's that not there really isn't. that interesting, though. It's it, not. It's like it's just. It's really, and I. This is gonna come off as like really bad, but saying it's like a poor man's spotlight. Yeah. No. But like, because spotlight is genuinely great. Mm-hmm. But I, I can already tell you what it is. People are like, oh, you know, I've heard rumblings about this producer. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah I. We just uh we got a a, a a a tip on this story about you know she's willing to talk and and you know they're making all these phone calls and then they're going and, and then they show a screen of a, of a TV and the newscaster is like the Me Too movement which has begun da 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 and it's like okay I like I know all this and I know how it ends he's in prison right now like I don't know it's just whatever like. Women talking was at least more interesting to me because it's like okay, there's an original story. Mm-hmm. Is uh, is it original? It might I, it, it is. might not be, but it's I a story it I've never heard of. And it's like this remote village, and I'm like, okay, there might be some more going on. But if it's literally just like how it sounds, I don't know. I was I didn't have that much interest in it to begin with, mm-hmm. but like, uh... yeah, that's that. Um... This next film I was terribly disappointed by because I think David Harbour deserves the world. I think he's great in anything he's in. And I feel like casting him as a Santa Claus is like brilliant. <gasps> you didn't like it. Did you see it? No, but I've heard good things. Here's the thing. I feel like I was misled about what this movie was. Oh, what? Because in my mind, mm-hmm. at least, and also in what I read about this movie, is that what this was supposed to be was an all out slasher where David Harbour's Santa like oh, no. goes insane and like kills people. No, 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 no. Uh, maybe you're getting it confused with another silent night, deadly night, but that's an old slasher mm. from back in the day. This was like John wick meets Santa Claus. I don't particularly like John Wick. I, yeah, I, I yeah, maybe yeah, that's yeah. what's like keeping it mm-hmm. down for me. But like this just felt um, even. I mean, th- th- the reasons I don't like John Wick are different than why I didn't like this. Ultimately, I just felt like it um, amounted to nothing, mm-hmm. and okay. it was rather like it was aiming for that, but it just kept missing the bar. The action sequences were nowhere near as interesting as even John Wick's would be. And it just was pretty mediocre mm. in every way. That was that one hurt to see. <sighs> that hurts. I'm still gonna watch it, but uh, no, yeah, of course. We'll uh, I don't mean to. You watch what you want, but I'm just like giving you what I felt about it. Just mm-hmm. and here's one where I think we we felt differently. And <laughs> I I saw Bullet Train and I felt nothing. Oh, okay. I really enjoy it. Okay, I'm definitely watching... Uh, Violent Night now? <laughs> Violent Night. <laughs> no, um, Bullet Train's better than Violent Night, though. I, mm. I would say it is. I I don't know what it was about Bullet Train, but it just kind of like tested my patience, and I got annoyed of it, and it just... I, I got what it was going for. To me, the funniest thing is about that film were the cameos. Like the the, San, oh, the Sandra Bullock, I'm just gonna spoil it. The Sandra Bullock and the Channing Tatum cameos are hilarious. Mm-hmm. Of course, they were both in. It's funny because they were both in a different movie that, this last year with Brad Pitt. So I wonder yeah. if like they took the time. That's why they did it. Yeah. They um, yeah, it was a favor for a favor type thing. Basically, and we all, I, I'm never gonna forget Brad Pitt's amazing cameo in The Lost City. Cause yeah, no, that was good. That was he deserves an award for best cameo <laughs> of last year easily. Um and watch they give it to Luke Skywalker. No, they're not doing that. That's not that's not an actual thing. But if it was, let's face it, that's how they would give it to. Give it a few years. Uh, I I don't know. They'll also add both best post credit scene. I I I was disappointed because I hear I don't know maybe it was a me thing, but like I heard a lot of people like really enjoy this movie. 
I had a lot of fun with it. I don't. I like the cheesy action stuff, and I know that's not up your alley. Very much not so, I would say. When you say cheesy action, what movies come to mind as examples of I'm that? I'm thinking just like, like B movie eighties action mm, okay. type stuff, right? Where it's like, I I think it's kind of similar to like the the monster movies like Godzilla. Ah, okay. Where it's like I like either you're into it or you're not. You, you either you got a thing for seeing two giant uh monsters mm-hmm. run into each other or you're like eh. Whatever. I feel like And I mean I'm that ahead. way with some types of genres. Sure, yes. Yeah. Like so. I maybe it does come to a genre uh difference in taste here, but I I I I I felt like it was aiming to be very comedic, as a lot mm-hmm. of David Lynch's uh, David not Lynch David Leach's movies are, and I just felt the script in that department was rather weak. It, 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 there wasn't very see as far as comedy is concerned. Yeah, I felt that in the beginning, um, but and I was a little bit like, oh, I get it, you know, it, t- trying too hard to be cute uh-huh. kind of thing. Uh, but halfway through, I think it started clicking for me okay. and then like previous stuff started clicking um like i for instance i thought it was very funny that when bad bunny shows up there's like this whole sequence that sets up his backstory uh-huh. like a flashback and then he dies a minute later yeah like to me that's that's like it's not an explicit joke but i'm like oh like ridiculous kind of stuff um, I mean, Brad Pitt's never going to fail to charm and enter- entertain me. He's he's good in he's everything. Very yeah. And yeah, I don't know. Um, well, I came in not expecting much of anything. Yeah. I guess also. Yeah, that's the difference. I was like, oh, yeah, like I actually really enjoyed this. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's not, for me, it's not winning any award. It's not top 10 or anything like that. But yeah. I was like, ooh, it's nice. I don't know. And also, it's just like a lot of fun actors doing fun shit. I guess like, just I like, maybe. Um, not only with the word of mouth, but I just I maybe expected better considering that I'm one of the few people that really adore Deadpool 2. And, oh, that's right, you are. In comparison to Deadpool 2, there was just a significant drop-off, and it just leads me to wonder, like, well, maybe it was Ryan that was, like, the primary engine that was guiding, which we all kind of knew already, that was guiding that film. I mean, Deadpool 2 is a masterpiece in every way of, every sense of the word. Like, I like Deadpool 2, but goddamn. Well, it's hilarious. It's funny enough. I don't know. <laughs> like, Would you prefer the... I think you prefer the second to the original, do you? Um, I actually don't know. I actually like think there's a lot of clever stuff with the original, especially based on the budget. It's been a while since I've seen any, either of the movies. Yeah, yeah. It's been a while. Let's be real about by that. By the way, yeah. that cameo by... um Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds. It's great because the whole movie feels like a Ryan Reynolds movie. It does, yeah. Um, so it, like this idea of like it was supposed to be him. You got yeah. a tummy ache. I don't know. It's fine. See, there's no. little things like that that kind of would work for me. And I do really like. Um, and they were probably annoying to you, but I really like them. Uh, because I really like them as actors. Uh, the two brother hitmen. Oh, you mean Aaron Taylor Johnson and uh, T- is it Brian Tyler Henry or Tyler? Yeah, Brian Tyler. Yeah. Yeah. No, I actually enjoyed them. They uh, worked. Like, they worked I, for me. Yeah. To me, this is like that was like the best Aaron Taylor Johnson. It's I think like the most yeah. charming. And yeah. Stuff. Absolutely. Okay. I, I I can see that there. Um. So there's that. Next, mm-hmm. I saw Triangle of Sadness. I don't know if you heard about this movie here that's like in everyone's top tippy top yes and i can see why it won't be in mine not anywhere close i'm just putting it out there right now damn no and but it, it was so let me just I'll, I'll just put this description out there for the movie uh models carl and yaya are invited for a luxury cruise with a rogues gallery of super rich passengers at first all appears instagrammable that's a great little word in there but the cruise ends catastrophically and the group find themselves marooned on a desert island so this is basically um i i have a feeling though 
this might very well sneak into your top 10 because it's it's very much a you film um but i feel like i'm making some boots i'm making it out to seem as if i didn't enjoy it i don't know what it is about it um this is just not going to be one of those that and it hasn't almost a week later that hasn't really stuck with me but um of course the commentary uh that it has to say the humor in its execution is very anti-rich of course um and the performance is definitely this is a much more interesting film than i'm making it out to seem like but um them's the breaks anywho uh i want to say that was um oh did you see bardo yeah did you finish it yeah what are your thoughts on that before we move on to the next uh few movies um I get what everyone is saying about this film. <laughs> yeah. It's a beautiful film and it's a beautiful self-exploration of a of an artist, mm-hmm. right? Especially in a certain point of time. Um but like I said to you before, I couldn't help but <laughs> agree with a lot of the like negative thoughts he felt about himself mm-hmm. or that people said about him. Yeah. Like and a lot of it was just kind of like, shut the fuck up. Like, <laughs> oh no, I'm a successful artist in both Mexico and the United States. But what, am I doing this truly art? Shut the fuck up. <laughs> but it's a, I also, but it's also like a beautifully put together movie. Mm-hmm. I, I love the dreamlike, um, sort of journey of it all Mm -hmm. and yeah and on a certain level sort of this man sort of like reevaluating himself and who he is uh, through his art um which is really the director uh yeah which is actually the director and yeah there's there's meta moments right Mm -hmm. where like they're discussing the movie that the artist made that's called you know the title of the film and then they're dis- they're literally discussing like the beginning of the film and like critiquing it within the film. Yeah, um, it, you know, it, it becomes like that. Uh, it's a beautifully put together film. Like, oh, yeah. There's some ama- pretty amazing sequences visually, and like I said, I I actually do connect or under or just kind of enjoy the character to a certain extent. I enjoy the way it's put together. It's very entertaining. I feel. Um, but I also understand sort of the negative that some people feel where it's just kind of like a director uh, jacking himself off <laughs> in front of the camera a little bit and then feeling shy about it. I don't know. Um, I, I I understand both sides. But like it was an interesting journey, right? And that's what you kind of want for a film. Right. And and he's very much I always say this, like I love a film where the, the director very much lays his soul bare. Mm-hmm. And that's very much what he's doing. Yeah. Right? Um and I think because of that, I really just I was very much able to sweat sweep myself into it. And again, if it if it wasn't so dreamlike, I think it could come off as greedy. Like like if they if it was played more straight. Yeah. Um but that, that dreamlike quality I think helps it a lot. Um Okay. Well, go ahead and get your phone out so you can have these subscriptions of the movies. We're going to start off with The Whale, but before, um, while you're getting that out, there was a really interesting panel that was hosted by Chloe Zhao. Uh, it was Chloe Zhao and Alejandro González Inarritu, and it was really interesting back and forth that they had about this movie. She really loved this movie. Um, and her, it was less an interview and more of her like just asking you know, questions about tips and advice and that kind of stuff. So also like seeing like what she herself thought in the movie. It's it's actually an interesting panel because she doesn't come prepare with a list of questions like, you know, like a Perry Nemiroff would and like it's very cut and dry. She basically just like throws that in the garbage and just like asks her the questions, asks him the questions that she's most interested in, which I think makes for a far more interesting conversation. So mm-hmm. that, I would I would recommend people to go see that one. I wouldn't. Why? You know why? I, well, no, I do not. But anyway, let's get on to The Whale. Okay, The Whale. 
Directed by Darren Aronofsky. A reclusive English teacher suffering from severe obesity attempts to reconnect with his estranged teenage daughter for one last chance at redemption. Starring Brendan Fraser. That's all you need, baby. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's also Sadie Sink and Hong Chow and Ty Simpkin. Simpkin? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Samantha Morton. Might as well say the whole cast because there's not a lot of fucking people. There really but isn't. Yeah. So, The Whale. It's one of the most divisive films of the, <clears throat> uh, what would you call it, Oscar season. It's interesting because um, I am not seeing as many people, I think the loudest voices are the ones that absolutely despise this movie and yeah, and, the, sure. and their anger is just through the roof whereas yeah. the people who really love the film are just much more reserved about it um or much more quiet and so i'm really I'm really curious to see what's the true representation for how much this film is like resonating well it's so funny because the first two reviews on Letterboxd are a five star that says it's the fucking Renaissance baby. Let's fucking go. <laughs> and then the next review is a half a star that says simple Jack or maybe Norbit for Aronofsky heads. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. I think what... <laughs> There's, there's a lot of things that people... Well, there's a main thing when people are going after this movie and why they hate it so much. But I think everyone across the board, including you and I, can agree on the fact that the performances in this movie are terrific. Uh, I think Sadie Sink and Hong Chow are outstanding. And, you know, Brendan Fraser is absolutely deserving of a win for an Academy Award. Um, and it seems to be... Um, and I think, look, it takes, you can tell how much you, uh, the industry now has seem, seemingly taken to Brendan Fraser because he may very well still win for a film that is this divisive. A film that will not receive many nominations. It will not. I give a shit. It will not receive. gets one and wins one. That's all I care about, okay? That's, that's fair, but I'm just saying that the, the lack of nominations for this film elsewhere does not keep because of that, it's not a lock, and the many things yeah, can I go know. wrong for it. But that's just where we're at. I mean, I'd argue Hong Chao would. I wouldn't be mad if she got like. No, I wouldn't be either. I wouldn't put her in my list, but I thought good. she was very good. You're right. Yes, uh, and she has had. I believe she's been appearing in a few lists, but that I think it seems to have dissipated some in the wake it, of yeah, other it's ones. Not gonna happen, no, but like, no. That's where we're at with this movie. Um, I'm not quite um, enthusiastic of this movie overall. I, I watched the film and I thought it was good enough. And um, I, I'm, I'm kind of really at a loss for what to make of it. Because I felt like the performances really did carry the film overall. And um, I understand, of course, that we're across the board, save for one... We're, we're dealing with some rather odious people on screen, and that seemingly dominates most of it, and that's just not fun to see, obviously. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have much to say about this. It, it, was, uh, it was there. Peter? All right. Let me get in here. Um, maybe it's... I was thinking about this. Maybe it's because I just haven't been able to view films in so long but i'm whereas i've been watching all of them but yeah <laughs> but i've I, I don't know a lot of the films that people are coming down pretty hard on uh this year yeah including like babylon i'm walking around going like i rather enjoyed that <laughs> And it's like, I I actually do absolutely see a lot of the issues that people would have with The Whale. It feels like very, I don't know, like 90s. Sure, because, yeah. Because there's like very central discussions on like Christianity and homosexuality 
and like yeah even the way they handle like obese characters like like it feels like a movie at a time like like this would would win uh best picture of like 1998 or something like with with the fat jokes that are in this um to be fair there's not that many no no um but yeah, <laughs> it, it it does feel a little bit like out of time in, in a lot of the way, mm-hmm. um, the, the central discussion. But I was never bored. No. And no. I was very much engaged all the way through. Yeah. And by the end, I was like, yeah, that was a nice journey, you know? Mm. Um, and again, maybe I just haven't seen that many movies recently mm-hmm. <laughs> that it's just like I'm aching for any kind of film. But it's like, you, I agree. The movie mostly sort of lives and dies on its performances, but all the performances are really good. All of them and it's are. it's like yeah. 90% performance because it's, it's very much stage play, just these char- these actors acting. Mm-hmm. So like Brendan Fraser is great and I really enjoy him as a character and I agree that I think he brings so much more to the character that maybe isn't on the page. Mm. Um, I hope I'm saying her name right, Hung Chao. Yeah. Um, I thought she's fantastic. Uh, I, you know, I, I thought she was really, oh, yeah. really good. Um, Sadie Sink, what a bitch. Um, her character. <laughs> That's the one thing where they're a little bit like, mm, no, I, I think I think the mom was right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was pretty clear if she was right. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, but yeah, I a lot of people like were very moved and, and found the film to be very, you know, empathetic and moving. And other people found it fake and just like manufactured. And I felt both those things. Right? Time it was weird. Maybe that's why I feel that way. Because I, like, especially anytime Hong Chao. Yeah, that's, she, I think she really so sold the, those emotional moments. Yeah. And stuff like mm-hmm. that. So, yeah, there is a sort of a, a, a push and pull for me where, like, yeah, some of it does feel, like, manufactured. And then there's other moments where I'm, I'm genuinely feeling it. Yeah. And, and I'm in there and I'm, and it's, it's moving me. Um, but I also think just, again, the way the film is put together, it's not like it's directed poorly. I think it's directed pretty, there's just not, not much, you know, it, it's all in one little apartment. Mm-hmm. Um, it ain't the most cinematic because of that yeah. fact. And it's, it's the nature of the beast. And I believe also a nature of the pandemic probably. Yeah. But ultimately I walked away enjoying it much more than not i would say yeah i would say with that too it just for whatever reason didn't click and it's just not been clicking mm-hmm. it that's the thing parts of it click mm, yeah and then other parts of it are like uh, <laughs> uh. Mm-hmm. so yeah but overall I, I think more clicked with me than didn't because if it's like if, okay, if just the performances clicked, well, that's a large part of the film. Yeah. So, what of uh, what have you made of the backlash, or I guess the discourse the of the movie? Well, like I said, some of it, I think, I I get it, right? Like a lot of people that kind of hate it, and they're like, this feels just like a, a um, a manufactured like poorly emotional manufactured mm-hmm. bullshit. Da 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 da. Um, I, I get it, I guess, you know, again, it, it, it works more often than it doesn't for me, but to certain other people, I can definitely see them walk away. Like I was referring more to the, the side conversation happening. That's kind of dominated oh, the whole, like, the fat, the fat phobia, phobia accusations and, and that again. stuff. Yeah. Um, shoot, you know, maybe this makes me look bad, but I don't consider it fat phobia when you're at that size so to speak Mm. and what i mean by that like okay if you're making fun of someone and being like cruel and stuff like that like yeah that's not right and you shouldn't do it it doesn't matter what size they are you know big or small i don't think you should attack people based on their physical features i think that's fucked up Mm -hmm. um but what i don't think is fucked up is to say that being that size 
is bad. It's, it's unhealthy. Right? That's it's, a scientific term, and that's bad. It, yeah, like I think of your six hundred plus pounds, and you can barely walk. You know, you can't even wipe your own ass. Like you need people to help you pick like, things up, basically. To even you like if you drop something and you can't even pick it up, you need you have trouble breathing. Like medically, that's not good, no. right? And, and and we should work to fix that. To me, it's no different than like if someone has any other type of addiction, right? Yeah. Like if someone likes to drink alcohol, cheers, right? Mm-hmm. But if you're drinking so much alcohol that you have you're an alcoholic and you have a severe addiction and it's affecting you negatively health wise. That's bad. And yeah. I'm okay with a film depicting that as bad. And I think that's the same with like an eating addiction. Yeah. Like if 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 you're a little bigger, like, oh, who cares, right? Whatever. But if you're um eating to the point where, where you have morbid obesity, basically. It's severely affecting your health mm-hmm. and your ability to even walk to the bathroom, that's not a good thing. And like I'm okay with a film depicting that as not a good thing. I, I guess and I, I don't know why that's we, we should tiptoe around that, right? Because I, I feel the same thing if you're addicted to alcohol, if you're mm-hmm. addicted to any other types of drugs, right? Negative um, addictions are negative. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know what to tell you. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I guess I do sort of understand that a lot of people felt that the film was like cruelly sort of like pointing and and and... Like, they tried to say, like, oh, how fucked up is it that people, you know, point and laugh, and then the film itself is pointing and laughing at um, Brendan, uh, Fraser. Brendan Fraser's mm-hmm. character. Um, maybe. Maybe. I, I, I didn't quite get that. I think it was more of, like, just trying to demonstrate um, what this addiction has sort of done to him. I which agree. It, like, again, like, I think that's, that's bad. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't... I I don't think anyone would look at a film that's about an alcoholic and be like offended that like they're portraying his alcoholism negatively, right? Mhm. So why would we do that with someone with like severe eating dis- like addiction disorder? I don't know. No, I I think that's a very fair point and um some people uh clearly felt differently about that. Um Yeah. So that's all I have to say. Anything else? No, I think we we covered it. I, I, I uh, yeah. All we right. talk how much we feel about the film. Basically, uh, now we'll have feelings on this Babylon. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I even have that song. Okay, Babylon, directed by. Damien Chazelle. Always make a scene. A tale of outsized ambition and outrageous excess, tracing the rise and fall of multiple characters during an era of unbridled decadence and depravity in early Hollywood. Starring Brad Pitt, Margot Robbie, Diego Calva, Jean Smart, Flea, uh and you know <laughs> Toby Maguire uh Babylon This is another one where I like I wouldn't even say that views are mixed you know views are pretty negative uh when it comes to this film Well let's let's it's weird because I feel like when it comes to the critical consensus I would say mixed mixed in that Half liked it and half didn't like it, right? Mm-hmm. Let's look at the actual percentage that it has on tomatoes for the uh, the critic side of it. When you look at the the metrics that we have with audiences, audiences did not like this movie at all, right? Like the audience score was it got like a C plus, I think. No, did it? Yeah, something like that. The uh, the cinema score wasn't very good. It was in the C range, and then of course. Um, I, I don't know how much it was ever going to make, but it didn't, it, it did especially terrible at box office. I think it, it did very terribly at the box. That's the thing. It got a poor um, Rotten Tomatoes average 
It got a poor um, audience and critics audience score. It got a poor uh, audience rating. Yeah. It bombed at the box office. You know, by every metrics that you would examine a film, Mm -hmm. it did poorly. The only thing where it didn't do poorly, now this might change going forward because this came before it, it actually opened, but it did exceedingly and surprisingly well when it came to nominations from Golden Globes and Critics' Choice. That's true. That's the I only thing we can say that like it's done well at, but who knows now how that's going to translate going forward because as we all know how fickle the academy is when they when they smell a stinker they kind of run away from it. Stinker. The cowards. Yeah. A stinker and not that the film is terrible and not that it's just no one saw it. Yeah. Um, Less people saw this movie than they saw Cats in its first 3 days. That's insane. And no one saw cats. <laughs> but the idea that some that people saw the trailer for Babylon and then they tra- saw the trailer for cats <laughs> and they said, yeah, cats is more of a desirable ex- experience to take part well, you in. You got to factor in that cats has some kind of built in fandom, you know? It was the most successful Broadway show of all time. I guess, but still, <laughs> that's insane. Um, Bab- how, well, how did you feel about Babylon? I this one and this is this is a much more interesting conversation because I kind of I've gone back. and You forth are the on official it. negative reviewer between it, the two of us now. So go. Ahead. Oh, am I? Yeah. Oh, I don't think that's the case. Look back at our last podcast when you were very much uh, attacking somebody rather viciously, and I'm sure that's that's going to come up again in this review. Um, and don't worry, I brought my knives. Um. <laughs> I this one's interesting because I kind of gone back and forth on because I I feel like when I walked out the movie with you, it was such mm-hmm. such an overwhelming positive experience, and I felt like everything it was doing was like hitting in the right in just the right way. And then a few days later, when I saw it with Kyle, there was sort of what I would call a deflating experience where by the time we reached the midway point, you could kind of feel the air being let out of the balloon. And by the time we got to the, to the, the, the last, um, the finale, I think it's called the finale, uh, the, the montage. I was just like the score by, um, Justin Hurwitz, which is amazing. No question about that. But maybe to a fault, because it got to a point where it was so penetrative to the point of invasion, where it's like, okay, you know what? I I, I think I'm about, I'm about ready for this score to just like, get the fuck away from me. I'm ready for this to end. And then as it like had its final conclusion, there was just this feeling of just sheer obnoxiousness left in me that really just kind of soured the movie as a whole. So those are two very different experiences. And I was quite shocked to feel that way because that's just, that's just not usually how I am. When I go see a movie and I liked it the first time and I go see it a second time, my expectation is I will enjoy it that much better. And something about this, maybe it was Kyle. <laughs> I think the haters got to you. Maybe it was Kyle. Um, but like I could feel him, like it's palpable. When when you you can tell when Kyle's not into a movie, you, I, and he was like, why why isn't he getting this? Because I think the the first um hour and a half is sensational, but and then it kind of kept going and going. Um, that Tobey Maguire sequence that second time really annoyed me because it just kind of it kept going and going and going. I look. You are... You let the fake news media determine your opinion. Incidentally. (laughs) Incidentally, I have discovered, and I think you fit into this box as well, I have discovered somewhat of a interesting correlation. One in which I'm sure once I I explain to you what that correlation would be, you would describe as, well, we're the ones in the right pile and I'm the ones in the wrong pile. I'm just putting that out there now because that's the first thing you'd say. First and last thing you'd say. 
The interesting correlation, much to my annoyance, of course, is the exact same people who did not care for Fableman's love Babylon. Yeah. Then, the, okay. Are you going to say what I just said you were going to say? <laughs> yes. Wait, okay. Well, you were going to say, say, what do you mean? What were what, you going to say? I just say? said right now, a few seconds ago, what were you going to say? And I just saw your face. You were about to jump into that <laughs> right now. So... Well, now I'm saying nothing. <laughs> I just, that's just an interesting correlation that I found. And uh -huh. I don't think I belong to either of those pods because, like, I don't think I'm one of the people that's throwing away this movie completely because I think I love so much of the movie. Like, first of all, there were a lot of people that were saying that Margot Robbie was terrible. No, she wasn't. She was amazing in this movie. I think her character is a loathsome presence and i think by the for me personally when it came to the very last hour of the movie i didn't care for her in the least as much as i cared about her in the beginning but maybe i was just it got to a, i don't know what it is people it got to a point by that last hour where everybody was just annoying me i don't know what happened sounds like a you problem i don't may know. have been a you me problem who knows there but like uh you know, Diego Calva's great. Brad Pitt is always great. The the sheer scale of it is fantastic. Um, and of it's course, it's an epic. Yes, absolutely. And the um, it's an epic because it has sheer spectacle. And the re the re uh, what's the word here? Just um, all of the sequences that have to do with actually filming something, I think, make the movie tenfold as far as watchability is concerned. Um, and I think part of the humor was, as one reviewer said, um, although I think he meant it in a very negative way, though, I think part of, uh, the DNA of this film is the defecation, the urination, the regurgitation, the fornication, um, all of that definitely is imbued in it. And at the end of the day, I really do feel like... I don't know what to make of this movie <laughs> because so much I enjoyed and maybe I need to go see it again, but it's like, I want to be fully transparent with you. All of the negative criticisms of this movie didn't really phase me. It, it didn't get to me at all. But then when I watched it a second time and then I got to you, something was different and it didn't click and I was unbelievably annoyed by that score bum, bum, ba, the, bum, bum, ba, like, the okay, score I, is I, fantastic it, it, no i i did you not hear what i said it was yeah. amazing uh -huh. but maybe too much to a point where i'm like okay i'm ready to be <laughs> done <laughs> with <laughs> this <laughs> and I, I i i got very much what chazelle was going for in that finale uh -huh. it's very like it's very much going for it. Um, but that mixed with the music. You used to appreciate when films went for it. Hey, I always do. You I, changed. I think <laughs> all I can do is really kind of like articulate to you what my experiences were while watching the movie. And then we can kind of pick it apart for why it is that we would feel the way that we do. But... For my second viewing experience, it I was irritated <laughs> in the, in that moment, and the thing that I was most put off by was like Margot Robbie's uh, Nelly LaRose character, where it's like, okay, you know what, I'm 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 done with you. Anywho, uh, while you are. Most assuredly about to paint me as um, rather negative, I, I do want to make it known that I still do not quite know what to make of this movie, and I want to see it again because it just doesn't it this this doesn't happen to me where I have very two different experiences with like first to second viewings, and so a lot of it I still like. But I did notice that the stuff that I did like the first time around a lot, did I didn't like as much as I did the second time around while still liking it. So all I can do is account for the experiences I've had 
and that's what this is. So I'm now going to turn it over to Peter, who will probably um, tear me apart. Okay. Well, um, you're a sellout. You're a, you're a follower, easily manipulated by the fake the fake news, lamestream media into uh, believing whatever narrative they want to put in. I want to make it clear I was not affected by any narrative. I read a bunch of negative criticism. It did not really gauge or sway me. What swayed me was watching the movie again and it not playing as well as it did the first time, which I'm sure is an experience most, if not all of us, have had with several other movies. Yeah. Um, I said what I said. And it's on the record. And it was false. There's that. I mean, no. So it's there. It's on the record. It's forevermore the truth. Uh, <laughs> I really, I don't know if anyone could tell, but I kind of liked this movie. Kind of? <laughs> I really liked it. I I think it's very entertaining. I think it's very enjoyable. It's an old Hollywood epic with uh, elephant diarrhea <laughs> and pissing and uh, projectile vomit and w- amazingly executed scenes and sequences with, again, just fun characters. Even, like, tiny side characters are so much fun. And I think it's it's so well put together. Um, I don't understand a lot of the negativity. Yes, the second half drops a little bit in intensity. Mm-hmm. It's a three-hour fucking film. I don't know what to tell you. It's, it's three hours you... and eight minutes, right? I I don't even know. Um, but showing you the demise of uh... everybody. Well, everyone, but also that time in Hollywood and the rise of the talkies. Yes, and, da, 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 and all of that shit. I don't know. I I think it's beautiful. I think the score is great. I think the um performances are fantastic i think it's beautifully directed i'm in i was thoroughly entertained throughout the entire thing um i don't know it was an old-fashioned hollywood epic about how shit hollywood is featuring Um, a lot of shit featuring a lot of shit i i don't know that um it's 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 a movie that swung for the fences. It swung for every friends at the same <laughs> time, and I just love films that do that. I I can't stress that enough. And it, I don't. It just worked for me. And, and a lot of people will will talk about the ways in which it doesn't work. And I don't. I guess maybe I can see some of it, but not really. This especially. Yeah, no, I, I, it, it's very hard. I've read some negativity, and to me, it's kind of similar to like the whale, where they're like, "It's all garbage, it's all trash, um, throw it away," and you know, just like very negative. Um, but again, yeah, I don't know. There's just stuff that I just don't agree with. Like, oh, oh, she gave a, a terrible performance. Um, what's her name? Margot Who's Robbie. Who's saying that? I've seen people say that, like, oh, yeah, her trash performance. And I'm like, what? Trash performance? I think people just have it in for her. I think to a certain extent, yeah. She's the darling of Hollywood, right? Like, I I mean, they can try, but that Barbie movie is going to... That Barbie movie is going to be amazing. Yeah, so... Can you believe we actually just said those words out loud? <laughs> I've been pro Barbie from the beginning, okay? From the first leaked photos of the uh, of the filming of the film, but no, I just, I loved it. I don't know. I I went down. I sat like when those. I a lot of people were like talked about how they wanted to walk out when the Babylon uh, title screen finally f- popped up, <laughs> like forty minutes in, and for only me, forty like, minutes. <laughs> and for me i'm like hell yeah so i don't know i just seem to have had a very different experience than a lot of other didn't people. drive my car had their opening credits 40 minutes in yes but uh to a lot of people i don't know that's a good film i mean drive my car was also three hours long 
Yeah, but Drive My Car, like by the time that title sequence hits, it becomes like an entirely different film. That's true. Like it really does. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Performances, I think, are undoubtedly great, and I think some of the the sequences for me were uh, my favorite sequences in the movie are when they are making um uh, that outdoor movie, that war movie. I think where Brad Pitt is playing I, I don't know the soldier, I guess, and then he kisses the girl, and that that whole sequence where Diego Calva has to go get the camera and then film it. That was amazing. But perhaps the best scene was um, them filming their first talkie. That was just frenetic and the best. One of the best scenes the tension, in any movie. Yes. Like, it was great. It was. It was pretty great. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how this movie performs going forward. Um, and I would wager perhaps um, the Academy being uh, who, who they are, uh, they probably would. They could just ignore this film completely. Nominations do not get announced until the end um, of the month. I think if it got better reviews or did better financially. Did better could, anywhere. Yeah, I could see it getting like quite a few nominations. Just because it has people that the um the Academy loves to reward for existing, mm-hmm. you know, yes. <laughs> like Damien Chazelle and Margot Robbie and, Brad, and Pitt. Brad Pitt and like the whole, even the movie itself to a certain extent, like old Hollywood, you know, music, baby, the whole thing. In any other year, this would be a shoe in for many nominations, I would think. Maybe, yeah. But um, it, it just seemed to not click with people. And I don't get it well that was Babylon shall we go ahead and move on to Ryan Johnson's second who done it yes glass onion directed by Ryan Johnson what does it say World-famous detective Benoit Blanc heads to Greece to peel back the layers of a mystery surrounding a tech billionaire and his eclectic crew of friends. Starring, deep breath, Daniel Craig, Edward Norton, Dave Bautista, Janelle Monet, Kate Hudson, Catherine Hahn, Madeline Klein, Leslie Odom Jr., and Jessica Henwick. So, you uh, notoriously didn't care much for Knives Out. Okay, now As we've reached Ryan a point in the Johnson's podcast where Peter is film. just lying. He obviously okay. feels bitter about the idea that I would, did not give Babylon a positive review overwhelmingly, so now he's just going to flat out lie. Because, as anybody can tell you, um, Knives Out has been a favorite of all of ours for the last few years. And okay. all of us if you were have any really looking evidence, forward to this movie that you love the first knives out place it right here in the podcast you can just go to the podcast we did and back if you in don't, 2019 that shows you don't. no no it's on the feed and obviously this is a stupid <laughs> conversation to have anyway go ahead um like i said it's um do you feel any differently about the sequel no uh glass on you i'm not playing this talking point here so just move on to I'm asking you how you feel about the film as opposed to what I would f- what what you think I would feel what I don't know what you were saying so you liked the film so obviously for many years now all of us have had um shall we say a spiritual kinship with Mr. Ryan Johnson in his movies that he's made um there's one of which has been mentioned oh so many times now for five years. Um, only the most successful film of that year and the most successful film of the following year on physical media, you know, but one of that has been like um, given a rather unfair reputation. So there is that. But of course, when Knives Out came out, we all thought it was rather revelatory and rather amazing. And um, we even did an audio commentary on that film, that you, which you can listen to um, on our feed right here. Um, this is a film. How did I feel about this? Well, unlike 
some swine across the, you know, the cast from me here. I did go and see this movie in a theater. And boy, was I grateful to have that experience because um, of all the movies to see in a theater this year, this is one of the more rewarding ones. Dare I even say this is one of the most rewarding theatrical see, experiences maybe he's, ever. He's doing this on purpose. Much like you were just now with whatever you were trying to do there? No. It, it actually hurts to know that <laughs> you will intentionally uh, say things to try to harm me. You I just think that said says that. a lot you, about you, you as a person. Uh, do you realize what projection is? Because that's what you do all the time. <laughs> it's like right there. Um, I, I mean... Part of me does obviously empathize with you, Peter, because as I understand it, you were the only one that did not get to experience this movie in on the big screen. Because I did, and Kyle did, and Alexis Moreno did, and so did David Francisco. So seemingly you were uh, the odd man out, you know, to go. As you notice how this isn't an apology? Ryan <laughs> Johnson you just go right back to doing his movie doing before. at the cinema. Okay. So. Yeah, I'm just pointing out facts here. I'm I'm not, you know, making any apologies for whatever you were trying to do there. Just like Donald Trump. Huh? I'll put it to you this way, Peter. Um, this movie is so good that I rewatched it. I, I finally sat down and watched it on Netflix yesterday. No, as a matter of fact, it was the day before. I was watching this the day before. And then the next day I was like, you know what? I'm gonna watch that again. <laughs> Um, I was expecting this to be the case, but I love this movie completely inside and out. I thought it was outstanding. And as it happens, it improves upon rewatch. Ryan Johnson is a filmmaker that cannot be paralleled, especially in this particular space that he's in. Um, this film was kind of great and improves on better than knives out Um, i guess that's easy for you yeah i don't want to answer that question because i don't know what to say (laughs) like i i I honestly don't know the answer i feel like both of those movies are on equal footing for me now I feel like it, like what I said to to Kyle. I think I personally like connect more so to Marta, you know, Ana de Armas's character in Knives Out, and and as a Latino woman yourself, yeah. as you know, a wonderful character in that. However, I I do think that the ensemble in Glass Onion, there there's a lot more to all of them, and it really weaves into, um. The story here, and of course, Benoit Blanc gets more to do here. So it's kind of like a this is an interesting situation where it's like I love both of these movies. I just don't under I I I don't know if I have a preference just yet. If you were to make me pick one, I'd still say the first one. But every time I'm watching Glass, I watched it twice this weekend. It was like fuck, that was amazing. Fuck, this is great. Wow, this is so good. Um. It was always going to be one of the best movies of 2022, and it did not disappoint. And of course, um, it's a great mystery. the The layers of the onion or the the are just so so meticulously planted. Once again, it's like hidden in plain sight. And then of course, just the rug pulled out from underneath you, the twists, the turns, the performances are sensational. Um, the production design, especially, um, the social commentary, definitely the boot was a big part of this film in ways. Maybe perhaps you weren't expecting it to be, but I would say it added it to the overall entertainment. Um, if there were some favorites, of course you have Daniel Craig there as Benoit Blanc, but I, I did particularly gravitate toward um, Janelle Monae um, and Kate Hudson. Anything Kate Hudson did in this movie, I was like laughing hysterically. <laughs> Every reaction she had. So, those were my thoughts. Peter? Um, well, as someone who 
you know, just for a little difference. Who actually really enjoyed the first Knives Out? This Once again, Peter right there is being rather um, disingenuous. Again, go back and look at the actual recordings of uh, our discussions of Knives Out. I could point to you the audio commentary <laughs> of Knives Out where um, I actually knew more about the filming of the film than he did. So I should obviously speak volumes about who actually likes the first film more. So, so as I was saying, you know, really enjoyed the first Knives Out. Wrong. <laughs> really loved it and coming into this one uh as far as like comparisons i think i really like knives out the first one more i think i like it more but uh glass onion is very close yeah it's it's very it's so good and it's so fun and the main takeaway I got from watching Glass Onion is like, yeah, I can watch one of these every couple years for like the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. There's so much fun. And, and what I love so much is that Ryan Johnson knows that the mystery, funnily enough, or not the mystery itself, but who did it? And that central question is not the most important part of the film. Yeah. The entertainment value. Yes. That is provided from um, the film in of itself is the most important. It needs to work as a film first and foremost mm -hmm. before you even get to the to it, you know, being a mystery. Um, but even then, what I love about his mysteries is they're never cheap. No. Because you see some mysteries and it's like they pull some random shit out of their ass at the end to make sure that you could never guess who did it. And it's like, well, that's just cheap. You should be able through rational deductions to kind of look at like, mm, well, it kind of seems like this person would probably do it. And with both Knives Out and, of course, Glass Onion. Glass Onion, that's kind of the point. Um it never feels cheap when if you find out who did it. You're like, yeah, it makes total sense that this person would do it. And it matches up well with everything we've seen so far. And, and you know, how the entire um, evidence that we've seen, da, da 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 But even beyond that, it's just so entertaining. The cast is great. They're so funny. Um, everyone is having the time of their lives. <laughs> And you feel it. And it's directed beautifully. There's so many amazing just camera shots yeah. that you notice. Um, my fa I think some of my favorite directors are just where you're just enthralled with how they move the camera mm -hmm. for even simple scenes. Yes. And there's so many times where it's just a simple scene of like two people talking and you see the way he moves yes. it just subtly here. And... I, I just like from a, it's beautiful. It's a beautifully directed, great script. Yeah. All the the actors are coming in and giving their all and having so much fun, and the mystery is legitimately fun. You yeah. Know? And it 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 takes all the tropes and it plays with them. Um, and it plays with you, the audience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course. And he loves. More so than any other um, mystery type films, he loves to play with the structure of the film and the way that you are, you have ev uh, not evidence, but information doled out to you. Um, he did that with the first one. He did that here. I don't know what he's going to do <laughs> with the third one. Uh, Which apparently he is writing as we speak. Yes. And I assume it will take place at a ski resort. <laughs> Um, I love just the different vibes the the two films mm -hmm. have. Like um, the first movie is like peak autumn vibes, yeah, and then this one's like peak summer vibes, peak vacation vibes. Yeah, I think even more so than summer. But yeah, for sure summer. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they just know to have fun with all of it, right? Because yeah. like the set design in both films, amazing. Yeah. It's so much fun to just stare at everything. Yes, yes. The costumes. Or, or the, not the, I don't know if you would call them costumes, but the um, wardrobe? No, that's costumes. Oh, is it costumes? Yeah, that's okay, considered yeah. a costume, yeah. 
Okay, the the costumes on both um films fantastic. Yeah. Again, you could just it's fun to just stare at these people and all the crazy shit they're wearing mm-hmm. and it's beautiful but also out there and and really pops off the screen. They're just fun movies. It, it's it's those kinds of movies where it's like, yeah, this this is why I like to go see a film. You know? Mm-hmm. And it, it just everything with it pops. And yeah, I can't wait it really is one of those things where <laughs> it's like a, a, what do you call it? Uh, I kind of felt the same with like a Mr. Jim Cameron. It's like, yeah, like you're just just throwing out all the reasons where I'm like, yeah, this is why I like to go to movies. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I'm, I'm here for the next one. You know, when's it coming out? <laughs> and yeah, for sure. It's a lot of fun. I mean, uh, there was just, just just so much to it, you know, when you're watching it again and again that you just like, like what you just said right there about, you know, how when you begin to notice how he moves the camera and where he takes the shot and how it's um all made to look interesting. It's like well, most of this movie is going to be people just having conversations and yet it is just so <sighs> captivating. It's twofold. I think uh, rightfully to a, to a degree, um, the screenplay gets the most attention um because it is the writing obviously that would not this movie wouldn't work and no movie would, would work without the writing but i think what's an underrated value of the film is ryan johnson's directing because i think the the directing i'm not sure that the whole the thing wouldn't work if ryan johnson didn't have the capabilities of the camera that he does let's just say and yeah. so much often that isn't as paid enough attention to as his writing for the film. Uh, I think people don't realize how much energy in a film is sustained by the directing Mm -hmm. and the way it's edited and the way the camera moves. Well, look how the movie opens. It's rather masterful. How, how many characters were introduced to seemingly all at once, but then, Mm It when you see it several times over, it's like wow. There was how was he able to do all of this so quickly? Efficiency with time, and yeah. it's not like it's a short film, right? <laughs> it's like two hours and twenty minutes. Yeah, but it works. Uh, he better have a a young Asian woman in the third. He's he's going down the minority list of oh women. My God. So. Latina, a black woman, so now he has to have the score was great too by Nathan Johnson. <laughs> oh yeah, the music really, really, really works. And mm-hmm. again, everything's just kind of like bombastic and fun. His cousin Nathan Johnson, by the way. I yes. Remember that. <laughs> but great. Who also did the score for the first night I was out and then also I believe um uh, Nightmare Alley last year. Um Another film that a lot of people Yeah pooed. But Literally. I was like, I love it. I don't know. Well, I'm curious to hear what were some of your your favorite characters in this turnaround. Well, for one, you you were like wondering for half the movie, why are people so like hot on um, Janelle, Janelle Monae? Monae? Yeah. And then, of course, once you hit that halfway mark, it's like, oh, okay, I see what's going on with this character. She was genuinely great. And then, yeah, she was great. Yeah. Um, Benoit Blanc. <laughs> Everything. Uh, there's a reason he's he's really like the glue that holds all this together he's so yeah. much fun mm-hmm. um he's the uh <laughs> although know, even less less of a cartoon than in the first one really you think he's more oh, of a cartoon on. here i mean look at what he's wearing uh, <laughs> i guess you don't know fashion Peter. and no and you know what he he plays it over the top on purpose oh well, yeah in the like first half uh-huh i would say and and it was a little bit like mm, he's really going for it for this. It's fun, but he's really going. For I it. was wondering about that too, because there was a there was while he was really going for it and very much over the top. I was wondering in the back of my mind the first time I saw it, Benny, um, you're maybe a little. Are you really like? He seemed, and he was playing into it. Obviously, now we know, but he seemed a bit too aloof. For Benoit yeah. Blanc, when he's first arriving to the island, and he's caught by surprise that he wasn't actually invited there, and he's like ooing and awing and like being very like um, you know, uh, like oh wow, oh 
Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I thought to myself, while well, funny, I was like, what's going on? No, it was all an act. Mm-hmm. It was all a fucking act. And it makes all that the better, I would say. Yeah. No, 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 no. Um, it's great. It's it's like uh, Yoda at the beginning of uh, <laughs> episode <laughs> five. Everybody strikes back. Uh, so yeah, character wise, of course, Kate Hudson oh my steals God. every scene. She's very funny. Um, Everything she did, every little thing, <laughs> like f- from sh- trying to Shazam a song in the beginning of the movie, and she didn't realize that was not a Shazam. The sweatpants gag. That's very funny. <laughs> or the sweatshop gag. I should. I should sweatshop say. sweatpants. Yeah. Miss uh, Birdie J. She's an icon already. <laughs> the Beyonce tribute, her going on Oprah. Oh God, when she said that, I was like, oh no. Yeah. Her going on Oprah and comparing herself to Harriet Tubman. In spirit. Tweeting the word Jewy. Like, God, every. And of course, the compliancy mask that she wore. Her having parties during the COVID pandemic. Like, every little thing. Oh, but they're part of her pod. Yeah. Uh,. I loved the uh, Dave Batista. Oh my he was god. great. Oh my god, <laughs> he was perfect. Mm-hmm. He was perfect. And it's funny because I saw Rain Johnson say somewhere that he had actually written it, envisioning like a scrawny guy. Mm. That's kind of like overcompensating. I see. But it's weird because I didn't get that at all. Like I thought, no, um, Batista fit perfect yeah. for the role. He was really, really good. Um, I really, I, I do feel like Catherine Hahn and and Leslie Odom Jr. were a little wasted. In As terms of what they can do, yes, yeah. I think especially Leslie Odom Jr. Catherine Hahn has some fun moments, but mm-hmm. Leslie Odom Jr. is a little bit just kind of there. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Um, I enjoy him, obviously. Yes, yes. No, he's good, but oh, it's like Jessica Henwick is more. always great when she's around. She's always great. I re- I want her to like break out mm-hmm. and into like because it's a lot of stuff where it's like she's she's in a lot of stuff, but every time she can get like her big role, it kind of like falls apart. And it's like <laughs> annoying because yeah. she's really really good mm-hmm. and like everything. Like she she went toe to toe with everyone else here, including yeah. like um, Elon Musk himself. Speaking of Edward uh, Norton. Edward Norton. What perfect casting. He's so good. Because, I mean, Edward Norton, he's like a world-class, like, he's like an all-timer actor, right? Mm-hmm. Like, A. He's in the A-list. Yeah. Um, But he's also one of those, much like, uh, what's his name who's in here for like two seconds? Uh, uh, who? He's the one that shoots him. With oh, the... Ethan Hawke? Ethan Hawke, Yeah. Uh, to me, they're both kind of actors who are like that. They're like A class actors, but who are like up for anything, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and yeah, he was great. He was great. <laughs> no, absolutely. If we can, I, I just have some questions I want to ask. This is going to be a spoiler part of the conversation for the movie. At what point did Miles know that was Helen and not? Andy, like almost immediately, or no, right? I don't because think, I think he's too stupid, right? To, okay, I think he didn't know until um, Dave Batista showed him, right? I think he was shocked. I thought, I think he thought she had died, but I think they even imply like he left, like he didn't know for what sure happened afterward. What like happened. he, sh- I guess, he's stupid, and if in you know, the, the movie takes ample shots to remind us of that but like if you were in that situation you were like wouldn't you run away or like do something because like wait a minute didn't you try to kill her Mm -hmm. and then she just woke up and did nothing that would not be suspicious to you well i think he's very um what do you call it unsure (laughs) unnerved yeah but um I don't think he knows that that's because I think he would have made like steps to do something if he knew that that was actually what's her name's uh, 
the sister. Helen, yeah. Helen and not Andy. So when, like when when she walks off and you see his face, I love that watching the movie a second time, you're like, this fucker You can is, tell. He he's, knows. He's like, what the fuck? I thought I killed you. <laughs> kind of a look. Like, what are you still doing alive? It works great. Especially because they really build up that everyone's like, oh my God, she's here. Yeah, yeah. So everyone kind of has that like shocked look. But his really sells like more than what are you doing here? But like, oh, what are you doing alive? <laughs> mm hmm. No, absolutely. And then also, especially because they kept it out of the the papers or the mm -hmm. news. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, I guess she's alive. But um, no, it's so wonderfully put together. You find new stuff every time. Yeah, it really does. You really do. Um. What's it called? Talking about this movie just makes me want to go back and see it again right now. Because it's genuinely one of the most entertaining films all year. And I think this will be one of the more entertaining ones to revisit. The man knows how to make an entertaining film. And I'm hopeful, not sure, but I am hopeful this is going to materialize into some, unlike the first movie where I think it only received a screenplay nomination, I'm hopeful it can um, materialize this time around into some more serious nominations. I don't, th I, I feel like Knives Out had more of a shot of that. Based on what? Uh, gut. Oh, okay. Based on your gut, you think? So you think Glass Onion's not going to get anything? I say it's not going to get anything, but it, it, I think it's less in the running for stuff than Knives Out. I think it has a serious shot at winning adapted screenplay. Really? Because... Adapted? Wait, be why is it, what's it adapted from? Remember the rules... And we can discuss if they're bullshit or not, but the official rules, and, and it is competing and adapted, is because it is a screenplay based on a character that's already existing. So, Benoit Blanc. And it's a sequel. So, anything that's a sequel is automatically categorized and adapted over original. So, it's not adapted from anything. But the Very reason why... Stupid. Yes. What a stupid rule. But here's the thing. That stupid rule is actually great because if, for example, if it was competing in original, it may not even get nominated because of how competitive the original screenplay category is this year. But the adapted screenplay is rather weak. And so there exists an opportunity, a path even, for that film to win there, especially considering if it ends up getting uh, a surprise Best Picture nomination. We'll see. I might not be a surprise if it does, I think. I think it's pretty... I think it's more likely than maybe less likely that it does. Especially because there's just uncertainty. There's a lot of un uncertainty right now as to like which movie is going to fill that 10th slot. Or which three films are going to fill in those last three slots. And it can go from Babylon, Women Talking, Women King, Glass Onion. It's, Let it's, me tell you something. It being a Netflix exclusive, I think hurts it. Oh, yeah. But I, Netflix, I think, Netflix... Well, go ahead. Go ahead. I think if it was in the theaters all this time, making all the money in the world, especially for movie theaters, <sighs> yeah, that would make people just all the more hype about it. And, and again, it being a genuine like movie experience theater all these it's not a superhero movie it's not all this action it's not a big blockbuster it's you know it's a murder mystery with all these a-class actors and you know uh, a known filmmaker like like it's a movie movie so i think it now kind of going to watch it on netflix i do think that hurts it because also, they don't like Netflix. They don't like Netflix. That's true. They don't like to award Netflix movies anything. But they do get nominated, and they do get widely yeah. seen. So I'm curious to see um, what it does. Just that I think what ultimately hurts Glass Onion is that it's just not the type of movie to get nominated for these things. 
I think it can be considered maybe too genre-y or maybe too comedy-esque for it um, to usually be in the the kind of movies that get nominated. So that it has that going against it, I would say. But that's why I said the first Knives Out kind of had more of a um, a shot at getting a into shot. that. Yeah, because it's less comedic. And it might have, but of course, in that year, they were not required to do ten movies. Now, going forward, the rule changes; they have to nominate ten movies for Best Picture. So, I guess we'll see um, where that goes, but. We're going to go ahead and leave it there. Thank you so much for being on this show. And thank you all for listening. As a reminder, you can listen to our podcasts every single Sunday. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anything. Um, and then we will be back with more reviews as the weeks and months go on. Um, and stay under our spotlight for more content. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.